So for today's species spotlight and the first species spotlight of 2020, we are going to talk about garter snake species. So we have three species of garter snakes living here in Washington, all of which fall underneath the Thymnopsis genus. Uh, we have the common garter snake, the northwestern garter snake, and western terrestrial garter snake. And as you can see based on these maps, garter snakes actually inhabit a good bit of Washington, and they inhabit a lot of different areas too. You can often find garter snakes in prairies, you can find them in forests, and sometimes we can find them at high elevation. But more likely than not, you're going to find garter snakes around aquatic environments. Now these three garter snakes can come in many different types of colors. Uh, you can get differences in the color of the stripe that's going down the side and down the middle of the back. The patterning of garter snakes can kind of vary as well. So it makes it kind of difficult to identify these guys by their color. So a lot of times what we do when we're trying to identify garter snakes is we identify them but by what are called labial scales. So these are going to be the scales that surround the mouth of the snake. Now, typically you can also do this based on dorsal scale counts, which are going to be scales along the body, but the mouth count is usually what we use when we're trying to identify a snake to species. Now, granted, if you're not picking up a snake, uh, it's going to be a little difficult to do. So sometimes coloration can matter, but the important thing to realize is that garter snakes are pretty unique in that they're not going to look like many other snakes here in Washington. When we're sampling for garter snakes, we like to take a look at the size of them as well as try to sex them. Um, and we can do that in a couple different ways. Um, this also kind of helps us see uh, the health of the overall snake, how big they are, and they kind of help us with bullfrog eradication because snakes really love eating uh, frogs. So the ones where we find snakes in sites that have bullfrogs, we give them kind of a little pat on the back and let them go because they're doing a good job for us. Garter snakes are non-venomous snakes. And some of their defense mechanisms that they use, besides puffing up and besides musking you, which smells absolutely terrible, is sometimes they will bite if they're provoked. Like I said, these are non-venomous snakes, so even if they do bite you, it's not going to cause any type of reaction. For the most part, if you startle a garter snake, its first response is going to be to try to get away from you. And that's the reaction to most snakes in Washington, even rattlesnakes. So if you leave a snake alone, if you give it its space, most likely, or more often than not, it's going to just slither away from you and be on its way. Now, garter snakes are some of our earliest emerging species, so we'll kind of see them as early as March, and they're some of the last ones to go uh, back into the den. They can be in all shapes and sizes, including really tiny guys uh, to really large three-foot snakes. Um, and typically what happens is we see them basking in the sun. So when they come out, you'll see them on logs. Sometimes you can see them on plants. And they're ectothermic animals, which means that they rely heavily on sunlight in order to kind of build up this energy so they can do different types of metabolic processes. Um, Typically, when snakes are absorbing sun, once they get to a certain threshold, they can then kind of move a lot quicker. Um, but if they're cold, they tend to kind of stay a little more still or they don't move quite as quickly. Now, the fun fact about garter snakes is that they're actually highly aquatic snakes. So a lot of times you can see these snakes hanging out by the water or even inside the water. Um, they're unique in that uh, they can go underwater. A lot of times we'll see them, especially when we get into western toad season. They'll be swimming along rivers looking for tadpoles to eat and snack on. And one of the most unique traits about garter snakes is their evolutionary arms race with our rough skin newt. Now, rough skin newts are some of the most toxic salamanders in North America. They emit what's called tetrodotoxin. Um, which can be fatal uh, to a lot of other organisms. So newts have this kind of ability to not be eaten. So that's why when you see a newt crossing a trail, it kind of seems unfazed by everything around it. However, garter snakes over millions of years of evolution have co-evolved with newts and built up somewhat of a resistance to tetrodotoxin, which allows them to eat the newts, which is pretty neat. Not only are garter snakes pretty good predators of newts, but they also eat other amphibians, including western toads and northwestern salamanders. So in this video, you can actually see a garter snake eating a neotenic northwestern salamander that's much bigger than it is. Um, they're able to kind of stretch out their jaws, so they dislocate their jaws in order to eat prey that's a lot bigger than their mouth is. 
um, and this way they can get all the nutrients that they need. Sometimes snakes will actually carry their food back to the water to eat it if they feel like they're being uh, kind of harassed or threatened by any other animal. In general, garter snakes are very sweet snakes. They're really beautiful and they play really vital roles in our ecosystems as far as keeping a lot of prey species down, including rats and uh, small rodents and stuff, as well as kind of keeping our amphibian populations in check. If garter snakes aren't eating rough skin newts, rough skin newts would kind of explode in their population sizes. So it's important to note that next time you're out at a place like McLean or Miller, Sylvania, you're probably most likely going to see these snakes out basking. Just give them a wave, enjoy the trail, and please don't harass them.